Power steering is now standard equipment on most new vehicles, and with good reason. Power steering reduces the steering effort, which is particularly helpful in parking and low-speed driving, and for emergency maneuvering. Until recently, one drawback to power steering was a less than optimal feel of the road at high speeds. One solution is power steering that varies the amount of assist according to vehicle speed or engine RPM. In this month's program, we're going to look at three Chrysler power steering systems that are speed variable. Grand Cherokee's speed proportional power steering system is new for 1996 and standard on Grand Cherokee Limited. A different type of speed proportional power steering has been used on some LH vehicles since the 1994 model year. This system is also used on a majority of 1995 and 1996 JA models. A third speed variable system is standard equipment on the Sebring convertible. This system is sensitive to engine RPM and not vehicle speed. This speed sensitive system has also been used on various Diamond Star and Mitsubishi vehicles. Because the Grand Cherokee system is the newest and most sophisticated of the speed variable power steering systems, we'll cover it in greater detail. Let's begin with a look at system components. The brain of the Grand Cherokee system is the Speed Proportional Steering Control Module, or SPS Control Module for short. The control module is mounted on the dash panel to the left of the steering column. One of the main jobs of the control module is to use inputs from the vehicle speed sensor and steering wheel speed sensor as the basis for operating the speed proportional steering solenoid. The control module also checks the system for malfunctions and records diagnostic trouble codes when it detects them. You may be familiar with the vehicle speed sensor from its use with other systems. The sensor is a Hall effect device which is located on the transfer case. Its job is to provide the control module with a vehicle speed signal. The steering wheel speed sensor is something new to Chrysler speed variable power steering systems. The steering wheel speed sensor is located under the steering wheel beneath the clock spring. It consists of a 30-tooth tone wheel, four magneto-resistive elements, or MREs, a magnet, and associated circuitry. It's the job of the steering wheel speed sensor to keep track of how fast the steering wheel is turning. The steering wheel speed input allows the control module to reduce steering assist to a minimum at higher vehicle speeds and yet still provide full power assist in cases where a driver needs to turn the steering wheel quickly. The Speed Proportional Steering Solenoid, or SPS solenoid, is an output of the control module that restricts flow from the pump. The solenoid is located on the power steering pump discharge port and replaces the standard discharge fitting. The power steering pump is a conventional vane type design. The power steering gear is a recirculating ball type. If you need to replace the steering gear, keep in mind that it is specific to the speed proportional steering system and is not interchangeable with non-SPS steering gears. Now let's turn our attention to system operation, beginning with control module inputs and outputs. The vehicle speed sensor receives a 5 volt power supply and ground from the powertrain control module. For sensing vehicle speed, both the PCM and SPS control module send a 5-volt signal to the speed sensor, which the sensor pulls to ground at a rate of 8,000 pulses per mile. If the control module is positioning the solenoid on the basis of only the vehicle speed signal, the typical pump flow rates are 2.8 gallons per minute at 0 miles per hour, 2.25 gallons per minute at 10 miles per hour, 1.1 gallons per minute at 45 miles per hour, and 0.7 gallons per minute at 75 miles per hour. The operation of the steering wheel speed sensor is somewhat different than that of the vehicle speed sensor. For one thing, the magneto-resistive elements, or MREs, operate on a different principle. Each element is positioned between a permanent magnet and the tone wheel. Current through the element creates a magnetic field. As a slot in the tone wheel aligns with the element, the magnetic field in both the element and magnet are parallel, and the element's resistance is relatively high. When a tooth aligns with the element, the magnetic fields are perpendicular, and the resistance is relatively low. 
The effect of the varying resistance on a 5-volt signal produces a speed signal. To produce an accurate signal, the steering wheel speed sensor uses two pairs of MREs. The pairs are offset so that one pair is on the edge of a tooth while the other is in a slot. These pairs produce phase A and phase B signals. The control module must see both phases to recognize steering wheel rotation. This prevents minor repetitive movements of the steering wheel from producing signals which would be interpreted by the control module as steering wheel rotation. In terms of circuits, the steering wheel speed sensor receives a 5-volt power supply and ground from the SPS control module. The control module also sends voltage on two circuits which the MREs act upon to produce phase A and phase B signals. When the steering wheel speed sensor indicates that the steering wheel is stationary or is turning slowly, less than 20 revolutions per minute, the control module uses only the vehicle speed sensor as an input in deciding pump flow. From 20 to 70 revolutions per minute, the control module uses both steering wheel speed and vehicle speed to decide flow. And over 70 revolutions per minute, the control module uses only the steering wheel speed as an input and allows the maximum pump output to the steering gear. The SPS solenoid works with a conventional flow control valve to control flow to the steering gear. To operate the solenoid, the control module duty cycles the voltage provided to the solenoid windings at a rate of 250 hertz. Under normal conditions, the minimum duty cycle is 5 to 15 percent, and the maximum duty cycle is 85 to 95 percent. However, in the event of a malfunction, the control module can interrupt power to the solenoid. Other control module circuits include an ignition voltage power supply and a ground. The power supply is routed through fuse 6 and is present whenever the ignition is in run. The ground is located at the front of the left fender side shield. Control module circuits also include the SCI2 transmit and receive, used for diagnostic communication. Now that we've covered the control module inputs and outputs, let's look at exactly how the control module uses the solenoid valve to control steering assist. At low speeds, the control module duty cycles the solenoid at a low rate so that restriction in flow is provided mainly by the reduced size of the flow control orifice, not by the solenoid valve. The restriction creates pressure against the front face of the flow control valve. However, this pressure is counterbalanced by spring pressure and by fluid pressure from a passage that leads from the restricted side of the valve to the back of the flow control valve. As a result, the flow control valve does not divert fluid back to the suction side of the pump. Because of the action of the solenoid and flow control valve, pump flow to the steering gear is at a maximum, as is steering assist. It's important to remember that even with the addition of a solenoid to the assembly, the flow control valve can operate in a conventional manner to reduce pressure as pump speed increases. This occurs when back pressure on the face of the flow control valve overcomes spring and fluid pressure on the back side of the valve, allowing fluid to escape through the supercharge passage. Something similar occurs at higher speeds when the control module increases the solenoid's duty cycle to restrict flow. The control module increases the duty cycle rate to further restrict flow through the orifice. As back pressure builds against the face of the flow control valve, it overcomes spring and fluid pressure on the back of the valve, and the valve moves back past the opening to the supercharge passage. As a result, fluid flows to the pump suction side rather than to the steering gear, and steering assist is reduced. The flow control valve in the speed proportional steering system contains a high pressure relief valve. The relief valve prevents excessive pressure from developing when there is a restriction in the system such as when the steering linkage is at the limit of its travel in either direction. When this occurs, pressure builds in the passage between the restricted side of the orifice and the back of the flow control valve. The high pressure unseats the relief valve check ball. Fluid then flows through the supercharge passage to the suction side of the pump. Before we move on to system diagnosis, let's try a review question to test your knowledge of system operation. The steering gear used on Grand Cherokees with speed proportional steering is the same as the one used on Grand Cherokees without the system. 
True or false? The answer is false. The steering gear used with the SPS system is specially calibrated for the system and is not interchangeable with those on non-SPS vehicles. The first step in troubleshooting a steering concern on a vehicle equipped with speed proportional steering is deciding whether SPS is even involved in the condition. Symptoms such as excessive noise or binding or sticking steering are probably caused by the basic power steering system. You can troubleshoot these conditions using Group 19 in the service manual. Group 19 also contains some general information and service procedures for speed proportional steering system components. Group 8W65 of the service manual contains information about the electronic and electrical components in the speed proportional steering system. For diagnostic procedures specific to the speed proportional steering system, you'll need to use the Chassis Diagnostic Procedures Manual, which contains diagnostics for Tevis Mark IV G ABS on Jeep vehicles and the SPS system on Grand Cherokee. Depending on the results of Test 1A, the manual directs you to various tests, most of which are based on diagnostic trouble codes. We'll look at these tests in more detail later when we cover our sample problem. For now, let's take a closer look at diagnostic trouble codes and what they mean. Vehicle speed sensor signal missing is a somewhat misleading name for this trouble code because of the way in which the code occurs. After the first pulse signal from the vehicle speed sensor, the SPS control module looks at the frequency of pulses. The module considers over seven pulses within 44 milliseconds to be too many to be real and stores a code. The VSS code can be set inadvertently because of tires spinning on ice or on a hoist. The code has no effect on the solenoid duty cycle. If you do encounter vehicle speed sensor signal missing, keep in mind that this code can only be erased using the DRB3. It's also important to keep in mind that other control modules, such as the powertrain control module, monitor the vehicle speed sensor for other conditions and will store a code if the VSS is shorted or open. Besides appearing on the DRB3, this code is usually accompanied by a speedometer that isn't operating. The diagnostic trouble code, steering wheel speed sensor signal missing, results when the SPS control module fails to detect steering wheel speed sensor signals. Any signal at vehicle speeds below 15 miles per hour causes the module to pass the sensor for that key cycle. But if the vehicle speed reaches 15 miles per hour or above, and the SPS control module hasn't seen a signal, it begins counting. After two minutes with no signal, at vehicle speed above 15 miles per hour, the control module stores a code. As a result of the code, the SPS control module reduces the solenoid duty cycle to a minimum until the next key cycle. The SPS control module checks the solenoid for a number of conditions that can affect system operation. At startup, the control module checks the solenoid for an open or short. If the control module detects a problem, it shuts down the system until the condition is no longer present. The SPS control module also monitors the solenoid anytime the ignition is on and vehicle speed is above 15 miles per hour. Under these conditions, the control module monitors the solenoid circuit for current flow above or below certain limits. If current is outside the limits, the control module shuts down the system until the next key cycle. Besides being able to read diagnostic trouble codes, the DRB3 also provides sensor and actuator tests that can be used with the Diagnostic Procedures Manual. As on conventional power steering systems, pressure and flow testing can provide valuable information about speed proportional power steering. To test the Grand Cherokee, you'll need the power steering flow tester 6815. Use adapter 6844 to connect the tester inlet to the pump on the 5.2 liter engine and 6865 on the 4 liter. On both engines, use adapter 6826 to connect the tester outlet to the line on the vehicle. Oh, and be sure to have replacement O-rings on hand for reinstalling the line on the pump in case installing the tester damages the originals. You'll also need the DRB3 to actuate the SPS solenoid. 
A pressure and flow test procedure has been added recently for the speed proportional steering system. Let's take a brief look at the procedure. With the test equipment in place and the flow control valve open, start the engine and allow fluid to circulate through the tester to remove any air. Then turn the engine off and make sure the power steering fluid is at the proper level. Next, start the engine and check the pressure on the gauge. If it's over 125 PSI, there's a restriction in the system you'll need to track down. Also check the flow meter. With the engine at 1500 RPM, the meter should show a flow of between 2.6 and 3 gallons per minute. If not, the power steering pump should be replaced. Next, using the DRB3, actuate the SPS solenoid for 15 seconds while observing the flow meter. With the solenoid operating, the flow should drop to between 0.5 and 0.9 gallons per minute. If not, the power steering pump is faulty. At this point, the procedure asks you to check the maximum pump pressure by closing the valve on the flow tester. It's important to keep the valve closed for no longer than five seconds at a time, or the pump could be damaged. To test maximum pressure, fully close the valve on the tester three times and record the highest pressure each time. The pressure should rise to 1,350 to 1,450 PSI. If the pressure did not rise to specifications, the power steering pump is faulty and should be replaced. Also replace the pump if the pressure rose to the specified range, but the readings are not within 50 PSI of each other. The final step of the procedure asks you to observe the highest pressure developed at the steering stops. If the relief pressure was within the specifications when obtained with the flow control valve, but low at the stops, internal leakage in the steering gear is probably the cause. Next, we're going to move on to a different speed proportional steering system used on some LH and JA vehicles. But first, answer this review question on Grand Cherokee Diagnostics. During a flow test on a Grand Cherokee, what effect should you see when you operate the SPS solenoid? A. Reduced flow. B. Reduced pressure. Or C. Increased flow. The answer is A. Reduced flow. The flow should drop from 2.6 to 3 gallons per minute to 0.5 to 0.9 gallons per minute. The speed proportional steering system used on some LH and JA models is quite a bit different than that used on the Grand Cherokee. Let's start by looking at the system's components. The system's solenoid control module, or SCM, is mounted on the power steering gear. One connector provides inputs to the module, while the other is used for the module output. The module receives power when the ignition is in run. On JA vehicles, the module receives power through fuse 4 in the junction block and is grounded at the left strut tower. On LH vehicles, the module receives power through fuse 6 in the junction block and is grounded at the side of the left frame rail. Control module operation is simple. The module receives the vehicle speed signal as an input and sends a duty cycle signal to the speed proportional steering or SPS solenoid as an output. On cars with automatic transaxles, the vehicle speed sensor signal originates at the transmission output speed sensor. The sensor output travels to the transmission control module, which sends a signal to the solenoid control module and to the powertrain control module. On vehicles with manual transaxles, the signal originates at the vehicle speed sensor. The sensor signal travels to the solenoid control module as well as to the powertrain control module. The SPS solenoid is located on the steering gear near the valve assembly. The control module uses the solenoid to regulate system back pressure in the valve assembly. The back pressure created by the solenoid affects the preload on a spring-loaded reaction disc in the control valve assembly. This change in preload increases or decreases steering effort. To see how this happens, we have to take a closer look at the components that make up the control valve. The reaction disc inserts a load between the input shaft and valve sleeve. It does this by means of a spring above the disc and ball bearings between the disc and valve sleeve. 
When spring preload is not opposed by fluid back pressure, in order to turn, the input shaft must first overcome the spring preload by forcing the ball bearings up in their channels. On the other hand, when back pressure acts to reduce spring preload, the input shaft can easily position its passages to the right or left to provide steering assist. Except for the control module, solenoid, and control valve assembly, the steering gear used in the speed proportional steering system is similar to the power rack and pinion assembly used on other LH and JA models. At this point, let's see how the control valve and solenoid interact to increase and decrease steering effort. During parking and at low speeds, the control module positions the solenoid to restrict fluid out of the control valve. The relatively high back pressure reduces the effective load of the spring acting on the reaction disc. The change in effective load makes it easier to turn the input shaft in relation to the valve sleeve to open up passages for steering assist. The solenoid provides maximum flow restriction between 0 and 25 miles per hour to provide maximum assist. In fact, assist is greater than with the conventional power steering system. At medium to high speeds, the control module positions the solenoid to reduce restriction to flow. The lower back pressure allows the spring to exert more force on the reaction disc, as well as on the ball bearings. As a result, in order to turn, the input shaft must force the balls up in their channels and force the reaction disc up against spring force, increasing steering effort. By reducing back pressure, the control module provides a gradual reduction in assist between 25 and 60 miles per hour, with minimum assist at speeds of 60 miles per hour or above. This results in about the same steering assist as with the conventional power steering systems used on JA and LH vehicles. Next, we're going to look at diagnosing the speed proportional steering system used on LH and JA vehicles, right after this review question. The speed proportional steering system used on some LH and JA models controls steering effort by A, restricting flow to the steering gear, B, using back pressure to oppose spring preload, or C, changing pump displacement according to vehicle speed. The answer is B, using back pressure to oppose spring preload in the control valve. As with Grand Cherokee, for LH and JA vehicles, general power steering system diagnosis is located in Group 19 of the service manuals. Group 19 also contains a description of the speed proportional steering system and related service procedures. Group 8W65 of the service manuals contains information about the electrical and electronic components in the system. Diagnostic procedures specific to the JA and LH speed proportional steering system are more limited than for Grand Cherokee because the solenoid control module does not have a self-diagnostic function. Nevertheless, some diagnostics are available in the powertrain diagnostic procedures manuals. More specifically, the procedures are located in the 41TE transaxle manual for JA and in the 42LE transaxle manual for LH vehicles. The procedures are listed under Test for Speed Proportional Steering in the table of contents of the applicable manual. The actual test number varies according to application. Let's take a brief look at Test 41A used for 1996 LH vehicles to get a better idea of the information the test can provide. Test 41A first asks you to check other modules for a vehicle speed sensor trouble code. Other modules do monitor the sensor, and other procedures in the diagnostic procedures manuals can be used to troubleshoot it. Next, Test 41A asks you to perform the speed proportional steering test, which in this manual is in Section 8.2. Section 8.2 is located at the back of the manual in the General Information section. To perform the test, you'll need to connect the DRB3 scan tool to the data link connector. Under Transmissions, access Miscellaneous, and then select Speed Pro Test. For the test to run, you'll need to put the gear selector in park. 
apply the service brakes, and start the engine. Then, once you activate the test, the speedometer will register 60 miles per hour to indicate the vehicle speed input to the solenoid control module. The steering wheel should reflect this by being harder to turn. Removing your foot from the brake pedal should cause the speedometer to return to zero to indicate that this is the input to the control module. The steering wheel should reflect this by being easier to turn. At this point, if the steering doesn't respond as it should, test 41A directs you through a series of checks beginning with the vehicle speed sensor circuit, followed by the ground, voltage supply, and finally, the SPS solenoid. Next, we're going to look at the speed-sensitive power steering used on Sebring Convertible, right after a review question about diagnostic information. Which of the following types of diagnostic procedures manuals contains the procedures for troubleshooting the speed proportional steering system on LH and JA? A, powertrain, B, body, or C, chassis? The answer is A, powertrain. The procedures are contained in the automatic transaxle diagnostic procedures manuals for these vehicles. The speed sensitive power steering used on Sebring Convertible and some Diamond Star and Mitsubishi vehicles is distinctly different from the two systems we've looked at so far. For one thing, the system does not use electronics. It is strictly a mechanical system. The vane type power steering pump contains flow control components that reduce pump flow as engine RPM increases. This is unlike the other systems we've looked at, which are proportional to vehicle speed. Another important difference is that this system is not nearly as noticeable in its operation as the other systems. At this point, let's take a look inside the pump during system operation to get an idea how its components control flow. At low engine and pump speeds, oil from the pump flows through fixed orifices in the valve assembly and then onto the steering gear. A pilot port applies pressure to one side of the control valve plunger, but pressure is not high enough to overcome spring pressure, so variable orifices also supply oil to the steering gear at this point. Pump pressure on the flow control valve is also low, so oil returned by the valve is relatively low. The relatively large flow of oil to the steering gear provides maximum steering assist. As engine and pump speed increases, pump pressure on the plunger moves it to the right, closing off one of the variable orifices. Pump pressure also moves the flow control valve to the right, allowing more oil to return to the pump. As a result, oil flow to the steering gear decreases, as does the amount of assist. At higher engine and pump speeds, pump pressure moves the plunger fully to the right, closing off the other variable orifice. Flow is now confined to the fixed orifices. Pump pressure has now also moved the flow control valve farther to the right, allowing more oil to return to the pump. As a result, steering assist is at a minimum. The effect of the plunger and flow control valve is to gradually reduce pump flow from approximately 1.8 gallons per minute at around 1,500 RPM to about 1.3 gallons per minute at around 2,500 RPM. Diagnostics for the Sebring Convertible Speed Sensitive Steering System are located in Group 19 of the Service Manual. Next, we're going to look at a sample problem on the Grand Cherokee's Speed Proportional Steering System. But first, try answering this question about the Sebring Convertible System. Which of the following is a component of the Sebring Convertible Speed Sensitive Power Steering System? A. Control Module B. Solenoid or C. Power Steering Pump The answer is C. Power Steering Pump. The pump contains the valve assembly that makes the system change flow to the steering gear depending on engine and pump speed. At this point, let's look at a sample problem on a Grand Cherokee speed proportional steering system. The Grand Cherokee was brought into the dealership because of a complaint that the steering seemed too light at highway speeds. During a road test, there does seem to be too much assist at higher speeds. 
To troubleshoot the system, we first turn to test 1A in the Chassis Diagnostic Procedures Manual, which asks us to visually inspect components for damage, and then connect the DRB3 to the Datalink connector. After selecting Speed Proportional Steering from the DRB3 menu, we check for diagnostic trouble codes. It turns out there is one. Steering wheel speed sensor signal missing. As a result of the trouble code, the Diagnostic Procedures Manual refers us to Test 3A. Test 3A first asks us to read the steering wheel speed sensor signal with the DRB while turning the wheel at least one revolution. To make sure you obtain an RPM reading, turn the wheel at a rate of at least 20 RPM. The signal does not increase as the wheel is turned, so the Diagnostic Manual directs us to check the steering wheel speed sensor connector located at the base of the steering column. The connector halves are fully engaged and the terminals are not damaged or pushed out. So we begin a series of checks of connector cavities. Cavity A, supply voltage, is between 4 and 6 volts. Cavity B, the sensor ground, does show continuity to ground. And we find that both cavities C and D corresponding to steering wheel speed sensor signals A and B, show 4 to 6 volts. So we proceed to test 3E, which asks us to reconnect the steering wheel speed sensor connector and back probe the cavity for speed sensor signal A. We then turn the steering wheel slowly while observing sensor signal A voltage. The voltage does not change. As a result, the diagnostic manual directs us to replace the steering wheel speed sensor. The service manual contains the procedure for steering wheel speed sensor replacement. Keep in mind that there has been a slight revision to the installation procedure. Instead of installing the replacement sensor with your fingertips, cut a piece of 3 quarter inch diameter thin wall conduit with a tubing cutter to obtain a beveled edge. When positioning the sensor on the steering column, make sure the pegs on the bottom of the sensor align with the holes in the top of the column. To install the sensor, Position the beveled edge of the conduit against the inner ring of the sensor, taking care not to contact the plastic tabs. Then press the sensor into place so the pegs seat in the holes. After replacing the sensor, we perform the verification test in the diagnostic manual to make sure the repair has corrected the condition. We hope that this look at speed variable power steering systems has given you a better idea of their operation and diagnosis. With the benefits speed variable steering provides, you're likely to see more vehicles with it in the future. We'll see you next month. If you recall, in our August Master Tech, we discussed Bendix Antilox 9 and 10 systems diagnosis. We looked at the procedure used to test for internal leaks, which is performed with special tool number 6685. Since proper use of this tool is critical to prevent causing damage to components, we thought we'd review the tool installation procedure. First, note that a wire harness is included as part of this tool. This must be used in order to avoid damaging the pump motor assembly. After the hydraulic assembly has been completely depressurized by pumping the brake pedal at least 40 times with the ignition off, disconnect the wiring harness from the hydraulic assembly's dual function pressure switch. Then connect the wire harness of tool number 6685 to the test fixture's dual function pressure switch. Next, connect the hydraulic assembly wiring harness that you disconnected earlier to the wire harness of tool number 6685. The remainder of the test should be performed as described, but remember, failure to use the wire harness of special tool number 6685 will cause excessive pressure in the system and damage to pump motor components will occur. The second part of this segment concerns using the information in TSB 052494. If a vehicle equipped with a Bendix 10 ABS system is diagnosed as having a low accumulator fault, or the pump runs continuously, you may try to use this TSB to track down the cause. It's important to keep in mind, however, that the first and last part of the TSB merely lists parts which are now serviceable 
and the associated service procedures. Replacing these parts is not necessarily part of a repair. To track down the actual cause, you must use the internal leak test referred to on page 7 of the TSB. This is the same test we covered when discussing the wiring harness that must be connected to the test fixture. For information about running this test and for additional diagnostic information, refer to the Bendix Antilox 9 and 10 Service and Diagnostic Procedures Manual, 81 699 or see the August 1995 Master Tech.